from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello and welcome to Palo Alto CUBE Studios. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here for a great CUBE conversation with Gilad Braca, who is a distinguished engineer at Shape Security, has a legacy in the programming world, one of the early folks working on Java, a variety of other great things, small talk, newspeak, variety of, of programming uh, accomplishments. Um, legend in the industry, thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having <laughs> me, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, one of the things we always talk about in theCUBE is, how oh, I work for a company, they do this, they do this great, here's our differentiator, here's our advantage, a lot of marketing speak. Um, and, and then we also do a lot of interviews around disruption, around cloud computing, getting to DevOps, network effect, changes of network, moving packets around storing, compute, all the benefits of cloud computing, but we, no, we don't really talk about the underlying languages that are driving all the changes. And this is something that you're an expert in. I want to get your thoughts on this because, you know, Computer science is at all time high. You can't go to Berkeley, see, you see what's going on at Berkeley. The number one major is computer science. The data classes, dreams of starting a company. But computer science is changing a lot. More people are coding, but does that mean there's still more computer science going on? So a lot of people are trying to understand where the future's going to be, and underneath it all is the programming languages themselves. Yeah, you well. Know, your uh, thoughts on computer science and the languages out there. So, uh, too much to say, but uh, computer science is uh, a lot, you know, there are trends and, and there's a lot of emphasis now on machine learning and, and things like that. And it's interesting because, uh, of course, the, that affects, you know, which language you use can make these tasks e a lot easier or a lot harder. And uh, we've, we've, you see certain languages being picked up for that purpose and a lot of uh, new languages being done, like for, for numerical stuff like Julia, uh, people are using R, God forbid, and uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that. Uh, to me, it's interesting because there's a whole set of languages, the APL family of languages, which really go back to you know the early '60s, uh, but they're just phenomenally designed for these kind of large uh, arrays of data for doing mathematical operations in parallel on on large. Uh, arrays or, or multi-dimensional arrays, essentially tensors, back before uh, you know, that word was used in, in programming. And uh, w there's, there's huge potential for doing better in terms of programming with those things. So it's an, it, that, is, that is one new, er not new, but area that's being kind of coming alive again. Yeah. It's really cool. You know, it's interesting too, you bring up a point, we were talking before we came on camera about Lisp and all these other yeah. cool science out there with now the advent of unlimited compute with cloud and now kind of new connected devices, a lot of the old science is coming back into vogue because of some of the use cases. I mean, I remember when I graduated college in the 80s, they had departments that were actually called data processing departments. Uh, and they would like to actually name, they use data yeah. processing. That's what they did, they processed data. That's the number one use case today is processing data. So a lot of the old is coming back because it's relevant in this new era. So I got to ask you, what is your favorite um, science and computer science that you think is relevant to? You mentioned APL. What concepts? We see TensorFlow with Google, you know, things like that coming back. You see machine learning and AI. These are not new concepts. Well, some of them, I mean, What's your def machine learning definitely there have been breakthroughs in the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And, uh, but, but the basis of it, the beauty of this is, the basis of this is, is uh, the old, the real hardcore math, calculus and statistics. That stuff is golden and wherever, you know, it applies throughout the universe and you, you look at, at reasoning about these things and it comes up again. That, that's, the, that's the root of it all. Making it so that you can manipulate things closer to the level you can with math uh, is really the challenge for, for programming languages so that you don't spend your life dealing with uh, sort of irrelevant, boring details. Oh, this has to be in lowercase, that has to be tab, this tool doesn't work on that operating system. Most of our effort as software engineers goes, we're dealing with junk really, and we should try and, and abstract over that and get over that. What are some of the exciting things that get you excited for programming language? Because there's a lot more excitement, a lot more opportunities now you're seeing. You can stand up software very quickly these days. Um, and so there's some really quick and dirty ways to get software written with languages. Some want more principle-based design languages that have all the integrated components. Yeah. 
What's the, what's the trade-off? What are some of the things that you like around the new trends? So um, I'll give you something that meets both of the criteria that is both very principled, but actually makes it much easier to, to put something together. Uh, one of my favorite new things that have come out in the past few years is a thing called Elm, which is a language, essentially the, the main application so far has been to um, build websites, essentially UI for that's targeting a website, but it is a, a functional for programming language, uh, but it is much more approachable than the traditional academic stuff, even though the, the ideas are basically the same, but they're, they're very well engineered, actually better engineered in, in many respects than, than a lot of the traditional stuff that you see, like the Haskells and OCamels and stuff. And it's, it's targeted for the web, so it's a different game, but it is a joy to use. It has great error messages. It has a time-traveling debugger, which is one of my favorite hobby horses, so you can actually go back and, and, and roll by the computation back to, to where a problem occurred. And uh, that, that kind of is interesting because it meets both of those points. Talk about this live programming. You mentioned rolling back, and this is around live programming. Yeah. Um, this is an exciting area your oh, thoughts yeah. on live programming, because we're seeing collaboration where I can have a screen open. I saw a demo at Amazon reInvent last year or the year before where people can be in different parts of the world or different offices in the same building and coding the same. I get the collaboration piece, but there's also live programming languages that have built in compilers changing the old ways of debugging. Your right, thoughts? so, so um, definitely that is, that is something that as uh, you know, people who have a, a heritage in small talk or Lisp kind of remember those systems, or if they're very lucky, still get to use them. <laughs> and the thing is that most programming languages are, don't have that level of interactivity when you work with them when you, as a developer, because there is too much of a, the feedback loop between when you actually specify what you want to happen by writing code, and when you actually see what actually happened when you run your code, and it typically doesn't do remotely what you wanted it to, uh, that feedback loop is too long because you have to go through compiles and builds and, and whatever. And the idea of live programming is to shorten that so that you ideally instantly see, you change something and the re you can see the output and the output gets changed uh, accordingly and you don't have to wait. And in particular, you don't have to go and you know, rerun your program, get to the same point where you were uh, especially when you're debugging, right? That's, that's the beauty of fix and continue debugging, which is sort of a small but important piece of, of live programming where you, know, you can basically go and change a, a function and immediately proceed with the computation. You don't have to restart. You don't have to get to where you were, recreate the state, make sure the heap isn't the same thing. And that just, A, it's productive, it saves time. Uh, it's, it's just a joy to watch and play with this thing. It's, it's much more tactile, you, yeah. you actually feel It's faster too, you don't have the, all the steps involved, right. it's, classic it's, debugging, it's, restart, do it all over It's faster again. and it's less error prone because those steps, you make mistakes, so you, you, know, you went through all these steps and you forgot one thing or whatever, or you did something wrong and didn't notice and you chased some, some you know, went on a wild goose chase trying to figure out a bug. And so it, it really is a, a huge age to product well, a huge help to productivity, and it's just so much fun to work with these systems. Well, I got to get this question for you while you're here because I get this question all the time, and and it's common. A lot of the young kids want to program. They think they know, they see the future. Yeah. They know that coding is a good yeah. skill to have. What's your advice to parents out there or kids, whether they're in elementary or high school or college? that might have a focus on say, you know, I'm a neuroscience major or I'm doing this, but I want to learn how to code. What's your advice for how to learn how to code? Because you know, I've seen, oh, learn Java. I'm like, okay, no, God, no. Not, not really my first choice here. Eat spinach, you know, you yeah. know do 50 push-ups. No, it's not no, that no, comfortable. No, yeah, no, Java's no. not my first choice for recommendation. It's recommend. also 50 push-ups and spinach are better for you than, than Java is actually positively uh, damaging. It, it, as a, you know, at an early age, you should not be doing that. Uh, doing so Java in particular. No, no. no. Why Java, is that? It's because, just too complex. Because it's it's a lot of irrelevant boilerplate. It's a lot of stuff that should have been obsolete before and will be obsolete by the time you hopefully get to to, to work for real. And it's painful. And if you aren't really into it, it'll just turn you off of the whole field. What's going to get someone excited? Is it Elm? Is it you know gaming? Is it some uh, sort yeah? Of so Elm is good because you can run it. You don't need much setup. You can run it in a web web browser. Um, I'm a small talker and I still love the small talk systems and they're still overall as a complete programming experience, they're still unmatched, uh, except for list machines, which are kind of hard to come by. 
And uh, so, so I'd focus on those. You People can tend to closure. talk about Python, they talk about some of these languages. Um, Someone's going to tinker around. What's going to be the addictive? If someone's so people get addicted to all kinds of things, but I would, I um, in terms I'm, of a good, I'm, good I'm, I'm, I tend to avoid the mainstream. Um, people tend to latch onto the mainstream because they think it's a good career move or yeah. whatever. Um, my advice is get good, learn learn the, the fundamentals in the cleanest way possible. Then the then the mainstream stuff will be easy rather than, than focusing on that, because there's so much irrelevant detail in those systems, and the programming experience is not that great. So try, try something a little less mean. Clojure is a lisp that you can use, and there's Clojure Script as a version that runs on the web. Uh, try Elm, uh, try small And all these languages, they can actually produce something of value. Yeah, they can definitely, uh, you know, I think still 70% of the world's container traffic is still run by a small dog application. Uh, but really, that's, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, well, few people do. Uh, uh -huh. uh, in Smalltalk, you find that uh, it's sort of heyday in, in some sense uh, for commercial applications was in the 90s or 80s, whatever. But replacing those applications, the typical story yeah. is someone says, ah, well, we should use Java because everybody's using Java and we can get lots of programmers. And they spend a lot of money and the, the new application doesn't work because they can't actually rebuild the thing they built in Smalltalk at any reasonable cost, at any reasonable reliability. So there are a lot of those systems out there more. Yeah. And Stanley is still running uh, Capital, their, their Smalltalk system for, for managing money. Uh, so yeah, you can certainly build things. Well, Gil, I'd love to have, I love your commentary here. So I love that you're not shy to hold back. I got to get your thoughts on cryptocurrency in the blockchain world. Oh dear. A lot of different languages. You got Ethereum. You have some saying, oh, I'm going to use Linux functions. Oh, you can, if you're using Java, you're going to import it in. JavaScript supports it. So there's been kind of like this every kind of like, uh, cryptocurrency blockchain has their own language for decentralized applications. So, your general thoughts on this? Uh, so there's a need for um, to slow down and be more careful. All right, Ethereum lost God knows how much money. I've heard quotes, I don't know if it's 50 million or 150 million, but a fair amount of money uh, due to, to problems that were classical distributed programming problems and could have been avoided by essentially more careful design of the language and the system. Uh, there's a pressure now to, to turn things out in a hurry, right? In, in you know, the old days, these systems took years and years of research and in their little corner, and now everybody has to to do something too fast and that hurts. And often it's people who don't have the, the expertise and, and the background and because there's yeah. lots of research on all kinds of problems and smart people get snippets of those and they don't quite know what they're doing. And I don't think there's a cure for that uh, because the incentives are there, but that's why we're seeing so these So be problems. careful, You're, the message is be careful. Be careful. But they're, they, we're rushing, all this cash is rolling in, they got to have some language. Sure, so as long build. as they're not their $150 million that they lost, that's fine, but uh, <laughs> so, someone was probably upset. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and by the way, that, yeah. was, that security problem was software error based. So Most this, of them are. This transitions into shape security where you're now working as a mm -hmm. distinguished yeah. engineer, um, working on some hard problems. I know it's pretty confidential, but you guys uh, do power 200 million I, I, iOS apps. This is from the PR statement. Um, and Probably more by now, but yeah. Past whatever. 24 hours, you block more than two billion fraudulent login attempts, uh, two million legitimate attempts. Um, essentially defending intrusion detection seems to be the company's value proposition. Well, I don't want to get too much on the company because you're obviously on the engineering side. Um, but security from a programming language side is run, it's software and people, mm -hmm. right? Software gets bugs. And people, people make, make them mistakes. worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People make them worse. Yeah. This, is a, this, is a, this is the, the central <laughs> process problem in security. Your thoughts? And yeah, and well, uh, so most of the time, I mean, Shape does real security, and, and this is fascinating to me, uh, but most of the time I've been looking at security at the programming language level, because, you know, still I think 70% of, of the intrusions often, uh, not the intrusions, but, but basically these big software fiasco security problems go get down to array buffer overflows which is ridiculous because this is a problem that was solved decades ago. Why are we still dealing with this? Uh, that's because, you know, programming language design, uh, the whole approach to security, um, access control lists, whatever, there was another approach which was capability-based and these two grew up together in the 60s and the world, as typically, it makes the wrong choices. It takes, it takes the what seems appealing in the short term and not what, what is sort of a more thorough uh, thing. So object capabilities is a, a really um, interesting way of looking at this thing. Uh, there are people working on putting some of this into JavaScript so that you could use it somehow. 
Uh, great work by Mark Miller and company at Agoric. If I'll do a shout out to them. Uh, so, so I've usually been on that side of things, and but real security, there's a lot more to it. That's just one small layer of things, and above that, there's all the humans and the multiple systems they build, the configurations, the, the just mistakes, the things that happen through social engineering, about which basically I don't know much about, uh, but I will say that making things simpler is key because that's why people make mistakes. Things are too complicated. If every piece of the system has some bunch of clever engineers who, who really think it through and make it really sophisticated, but when you compose these, it becomes no one understand, a thing that no one understands what's going on, and we need to simplify. And my, my work is to try to simplify at the programming language level, which the typical languages people use are too complex. And this is really where the software always has holes in it, and you just got to be on top of it and make it tight. That's right, you, basically you can't see, understand the consequences when you have too many moving parts, as it were, too many constructs say, in a programming language. The composition is endless and you can't, it's very hard to foresee how, how they're going to interact and what someone will come up with eventually. Oh, you could use this to attack that, or this creates this bad scenario that people don't notice. And really there's no remedy to that you can you can work and you should be careful you should test things you should verify if you can formally but if you just try and keep it simple clean abstractions that are very simple and compose well uh, you will simply avoid by definition most of these problems final talk track around open source um, it's been well documented that proprietary software that's funded by companies when kind of stopped and in innovating kind of dies on the vine Open source is great, got leverage, you get it out in the open, uh, it's great. So the open source has been growing like a, like a weed over the past couple decades and, and recently it's been phenomenal. The open source people say, oh, security is better in open source. At the same time, this you bring up the notion of language security in the programming mm -hmm. languages. How do you see that um, um, rectifying itself? How is the security paradigm with open source going to be stabler? What's, what do companies need to do? Because open source is being used everywhere. Open source is used everywhere for good reason, but open source is not, uh, you know, by itself a magic thing, right? It's still, uh, you, you, you get problems, you get, you, open source is also open to malicious contributors, to, to problems, and the systems are too big for, even though there are code reviews and everything, so, so it's a double-edged sword in some respects, and, and sometimes the quality just suffers. Uh, these are social organizations, and each one is different, and they have problems, so I don't know that that is, it's, it's good that you, know, you shine light on something, it tends to, to purify it, and there's certainly that, that, that's a great strength of open source, that you can't have things buried in there that you don't know. Uh, by the same token, it is not you know, a panacea, when, uh, because often, and all, the other thing is, someone has to fund this somehow. Mm -hmm. All the open source models have, have to find somewhere to keep this going. Uh, so it's a more complicated thing to pull off than yeah, have someone Especially with all these something. appliances now, it's like, yeah. okay, which version of Linux are you running? Do, I don't need, do I review the code? How do people ensure the security, knowing that whether it's an appliance or a device or a phone or anything, and it doesn't have some sort of backdoor or security vulnerability? Well, backdoor, I don't, back I don't get excited door. about backdoors. Yeah. This, this is code, a conspiracy theory. Or just poor, or poor code. Poor code, well, poor code, you know, the open source is full of poor code is the truth. And the other thing is that if, well, one problem with the open source is it also makes it easier for people to, uh, to attack it because they can see how it's engineered. So, you know, there is a reason that secure systems tend to actually uh, maintain a certain level of secrecy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go overboard on, on, you know, the open source ideology that it's inherently more secure. It, it has the advantage that you can see what you're getting. It has the disadvantage that everyone, including your, your adversaries, can see that. So, you got to know that yeah. going in, buyer yeah. beware kind of philosophy. Yes, yeah. and, and so ultimately you need to trust, like um, it, it always comes down to trust at some level because there's no way you're going to verify the software, the hardware, yeah. the bits, the, you know, you can have problems in the hardware. This is a big problem nowadays actually with, with certain vendors and, and it's, uh, I don't want to get in those political footballs, but. Yeah, super micro. Yeah, and so you, you, really, you really have to see who, you do have to take a risk, and who do you trust? Who has a reputation? Who is responsible for, for things that have worked? And uh, there are no easy answers, and well, it's Capital One, beyond my pay grade, really. So, well, let me get your thoughts on Capital One, because we know that is story is hot as of this week, and, and they an, had an Amazon S3 bucket, firewall filtering failed, someone just stumbled into it. I mean, the person that hacked it wasn't like a probably a famous hacker. She was bragging on Twitter and in message groups, like saying, hey, I just got in. Yeah. So. Doors open, keys are running in the car. 
Walked right to the safe, the safe was open. So uh, was I, a, I don't know anything the, about that incident specifically. And uh, all, I mean, beyond what you and I have read in like on, on the web or somewhere. That's a human error. Yeah, that, the people? But there are usually, uh, usually there's always, almost always human error involved. Uh, it's also why you need sort of, uh, it's like uh, countermeasures, right? And counter, counter, countermeasures. Uh, it's like, you know, the, you, you simply have to monitor. Right, you you have to be so that when something when you have an intrusion, you check it. Now that's not easy, but there are lots of, of clever things that people are doing. Uh, you know, you can't have security as afterthought. It's really hard. You you that's generally the problem is that people don't think about it early enough. Final question before we break: What's the human problem that you see most with developers? Because uh, if if humans make mistakes, which they do, what's the common mistake? developers, programmers make when coding that could be avoided with just a little bit sharper focus? Uh, well, it's not about focus, but I'd say uh, null pointer exceptions are the biggest, like uh, after array buffers, they're the other, you know, Tony Hoare called it a billion dollar mistake in 1980 and it's during award speech, I think. And we're talking now, it's probably a trillion dollars, right? And this is something that can be mechanically checked by the programming language. And it's probably the, the number one you know, bang for buck feature that, that you might throw in. Just say no to no. Yeah. That's the yeah. philosophy. Yeah. Gilad, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate Thank you the very conversation. Much. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto at theCUBE Studios. Stick been a CUBE conversation. Thanks for watching.